And um, I will do a more thorough introduction of Sue, but uh, before I do that, I want to introduce Michael McGrath, who is the president of the Preservation Delaware Board of Directors, so he can say a few words. Thanks, Jules. I am Michael McGrath, president of Preservation Delaware, but no, I'm not the Mike McGrath of You Bet Your Garden. Sorry about that. But you can bet that PDI is really proud to bring you this outstanding workshop today. We're gratified that almost 300 people signed up for this workshop. I see that there's already, well, we're working towards 100 online already. And we're fortunate to have with us today, Dr. Jules Brook, who will be moderating, and also very pleased to have Dr. Susan Barton leading this online workshop. And I wanna let you know that this fall, we're planning another great workshop that you won't want to miss. It'll be looking at the impacts, the solutions surrounding climate change, sea level rise, and impacts to our historical resources and archeological resources. With a national expert in the field leading that workshop, Dominique Hawkins. Now beyond workshops like this one, PDI is standing up for what's being torn down in Delaware. We're fighting for historic properties, archeological sites, and the cultural landscapes that make up the fabric of Delaware's history. Opposing the demolition of historic structures like the Houston House in Newcastle County, that's in the picture behind me today on this Zoom conference. And we're forming a new African-American task force to do a deep dive and inventory into the often overlooked buildings, sites, and people who make up the rich fabric of the African-American history, which is part of our history here in Delaware. We're working on an education in initiative to produce a major educational project concerning the Native American history along Delaware's rivers and the earliest contacts with European settlers. PDI believes strongly that preserving our history enhances the quality of life for all Delawareans. We also believe that this history and all the physical evidence that we protect make for a better future for all of us. I invite each of you to share in this vital work. Now, you'll see on your screen today a URL, a website, where you can contribute financially to the work that we do. It's preservationde.org support. And I urge you to go there and take a look at our website. But perhaps even more importantly, why not join hundreds of other people who support our mission by joining PDI and adding your voice in support of historic preservation? I'll bet that it'll be a rewarding experience for you. And now I wanna turn it back to Jules. Thank you, Mike. That's a great introduction of PDI. Um, just so folks know who I am, I'll be the moderator today. Um, Dr. Jules Brock, I work at the University of Delaware. I'm the director of the Landscape Architecture Program and a close colleague of Sue Barton, who is on faculty as a Landscape Architecture faculty member. And um, I'm also the garden chair of PDI, so uh, the garden that we uh, take care of and are stewards of is Gibraltar. And today, Sue and I are going to attempt some technological wonder by having me go over to the garden uh, during the middle of the talk to show you some of the plants that are um, problematic in uh, the gardens, the Marion Coffin Gardens at Gibraltar. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce Sue Barton. She's a professor in plant and soil sciences at the University of Delaware. Uh, she's worked closely for the past 20 years with DelDOT to research and implement new roadside vegetation management strategies. She's also worked with partners to develop the Plants for a Livable Delaware program designed to provide alternatives to known invas invasive plant species and to promote sustainable landscaping. She, te she teaches uh, many courses, including plants and human culture, farm to table, field sketching of landscape subjects, the Landscape Architecture Symposium, and she coordinates the Landscape Horticultural Internship for our program. Uh, she also works closely with the nursery and landscape industry, writing newsletters, organizing short courses, and conducting horticultural um, industry expos with the Delaware Nursery and Landscape Association. She received the Nursery Extension Award in 1995 from the American Nursery and Landscape Association and the Ratledge Award for service from the University of Delaware in 2007. She's a CITES accredited, a CITES AP certified uh, 
professional, and uh, she received that accreditation in 2017. Um, I could say a lot more about Sue. We're close and personal colleagues and friends, but I will turn it over to her at this point so that you can hear the uh, hear her talk. So go ahead, Sue. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Jules. Well, that was great. And I'm very excited to be here and talking about historic landscapes and how to deal with invasive plants in those landscapes. And my talk will start with um, Gibraltar, the landscape that you all are probably the most familiar with, but I am going to sort of delve off into other aspects of um, controlling and understanding and controlling invasive plants, as well as just focusing on some of the issues that uh, you face in this particular historic landscape. So Gibraltar was designed by Marion Coffin as a number of gardens of that era and in Delaware were. University of Delaware Green is one of them. Uh, Mary, this is the sign acknowledging Marian uh, Coffin's role in Magnolia Circle. Um, and uh, another garden in the area that she designed was, uh, is Winterthur. Um, and um, she designed Tower Hill and the list sort of goes on. Um, when she designed those landscapes, she was not really thinking about sustainability. These were formal landscapes. They were designed for a very specific purpose and clientele. It's definitely something that we want to preserve, but I'm going to give you some suggestions today about how we might be able to preserve those uh, gardens with their intent, but maybe incorporate just a little bit more sustainability into those gardens that we need to manage in today's environment. So what is a sustainable landscape? This is something that we grappled with at UD a number of years ago when a group of us got together and said, you know, sustainability is the new buzzword. How are we defining sustainable landscape? And we came up with really two major bullets. One is that a sustainable landscape is a stable and productive ecosystem. So it's not static, of course, because it's a, it's a growing thing. Um, landscapes are always growing and changing, but if they're stable and productive, they can be sustainable. And the second bullet is conserving physical and biological processes that occur on the landscape. So what does that exactly mean? Here's a good example of that. A process that occurs every year is leaves fall off the trees and uh, in a forest, they land on the ground, they uh, decompose, their nutrients are returned to the soil and that nutrient cycle just continues on and on. In a managed landscape, that may not happen. Uh, the leaves are raked off the lawn because they would exclude light and potentially you know, kill the lawn if you allow the leaves to stay on the lawn. Um, so how can we sort of modify what we do in our planned landscapes to take advantage of this really important sustainable nutrient cycling function that's built into the ecosystem. And one way to do that is simply rake the leaves into a landscape bed like it's done in this image. But if you have a historic landscape, that might not be so appropriate to have large leaves in your landscape bed. That doesn't mean that you can't still follow this principle. You can use leaf mulch that's been chopped and recycled and put back on the landscape. I'm a big proponent of leaf mulch rather than hardwood bark mulch in pretty much any landscape. So in the past, we focused when we planned landscapes and Marion Coffin certainly did on the decorative value of the landscape, um, thinking about where focal points occurred, what she wanted to screen, what she wanted to frame or anchor. And in today's um, context, we really need to balance that decorative value of the landscape with some environmental components. You know, how does the landscape contribute to the food web? Does it provide pollinator habitat? Does it sequester carbon? Does it manage water? So um, that doesn't mean we get rid of the decorative value of the landscape. We just need to balance it 
with the ecosystem value. And so one of the ways to do that is to think about the ecosystem services that are provided by a landscape. So landscapes can really help us clean water. Um, so they manage both water quality and water quantity. Um, plants can pull both particulates and toxins out of the air and they certainly provide wild, wildlife habitat and uh, pollination services, especially if you use native plants. And I think we're all on board with how a landscape can engage human beings and provide stress release and pleasure, as um, many of you have found in a garden like Gibraltar. So the challenge when we're dealing with a historic garden is how can we preserve those historical components, but at the same time increase the ecosystem services that are provided by the garden. And um, this is this little equation, biodiversity equals ecosystem services, is a lecture in and of itself. So you're, for the purpose of this lecture, you're going to have to just believe me that this is true. Um, so the more biodiversity that we can get in the landscape, and particularly upping the component of native plants to support native insects and on up the food chain, then the, the better ecosystem services we will be able to provide. So one of the types of landscape that is so prevalent in the US is the lawn. Um, there have been books written about the love affair that the Americans have with their lawn. Um, and the lawn just, while it is a plant and it does take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen, and it's certainly better than a paved surface for allowing water to infiltrate. It does not produce very much biodiversity, and therefore it doesn't provide very many ecosystem services to the landscape. That may have, and, and, and you know, where did we come to this love affair with the lawn? Uh, we came about it honestly, our predecessors, had this love affair with the lawn. Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a famous landscape architect who designed Central Park in New York City, says probably the advantages of civilization can be found illustrated and demonstrated under no other circumstances so completely as in some suburban neighborhoods where each family abode stands 50 or 100 feet or more apart from all others and at some distance from the public road. And he, what, what he doesn't explicitly say, but what he means is that that 50 or 100 feet is occupied by a green lawn. And um, that is what we have grown up with. That is what we are familiar with and comfortable with. But if we just have landscapes like this that are predominantly lawn with very few other plants involved, there's low biodiversity and there are few ecosystem services available in a landscape like this. Now that's fine if we can get our ecosystem services someplace else, but as the U.S. has developed, there's less and less open space available for providing those ecosystem services, particularly on the East Coast. As you can see, it's sort of one big light over there where we live. And um, we just don't have enough free open space providing the ecosystem services we need to survive any longer. That does not mean that we should eliminate lawn from the landscape entirely. Um, lawn is really the only plant that we can walk on, so it provides a really important purpose in circulation through the landscape. It provides a gathering space. Very few people would want to sit in this chair out in the middle of a tall um, meadow. Uh, while meadows are great, they don't provide a very good gathering space for people to enjoy. And lawns are also a way to have recreation in the landscape. So we want to keep lawn, we just want to use lawn appropriately. A lawn does not need to be this big. There's really no purpose to having a lawn that's this size. So what are you going to have if you don't have lawn? You can have a couple of different options. You could have a, a, a meadow, 
Meadows provide much better water management. This meadow allows water to infiltrate, slows water down from rushing down that hill and allows it to infiltrate and become filtered and cleansed. Um, so everything on this list is provided by, by a meadow. Next option would be to have a landscape bed. Again, better water management, water infiltrates into this diverse planting bed. More wildlife is supported, especially if native plants are used. And of course, landscape beds look very attractive. And gardens like Gibraltar have a lot of landscape beds in them, which is great. Um, but this is the most expensive option other than lawn uh, because it requires the planting of these plants and then it requires the maintenance of keeping these landscape beds weeded. The third option is forest or woodland. We tend to think of forests as large, but small wooded groves can provide a lot of the ecosystem services that are provided by even a larger forest. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, one of the things that a forest does is it has many different layers, the tallest trees, the, the understory trees, the shrubs, the ground layer, and each one of those breaks the fall of a droplet of water, so it dramatically reduces in erosion. It also pulls a lot of particulates out of the air. If you think about a lawn, you have that one blade of grass in a square inch. If you take a square inch of a forest, you've got all different layers of plants filling up that, that space. But the forest or the woodland is probably the area that is most impacted by invasive plants. And of course, that's the subject of the talk here today. So here's a forested area and the ground layer in this forest is pretty much all invasive plants. Multiflora rose, uh, climbing bittersweet, honeysuckle, just, you know, a lot of the, the, the known offenders. Uh, so what can you do about that? Well, you can renovate some of these areas that have become invaded. This is a project that Jules and I worked on a number of years ago on the old Hercules site, um, it, which is now Ashland Chemical Company. They had a small wooded grove completely choked with invasive species. And we went in and we removed those invasives, mowed a lot of them down, um, but that's not good enough. <laughs> Once that's been done, you have to prevent them from coming back. So you have to be on top of the spot spraying and you have to put something else in their place. So something else has to hold the space. And we'll talk about those concepts more as we progress through, through the rest of this lecture. But I just wanted to start off with this example of this small little woodland that had been renovated and removed of uh, cleared of invasive plants and um, put on the, on the course of sustainability. So um, back when we were first talking about this lecture, I was going to break people up into individual groups and have you do a little bit of research on your own, but that is not manageable with, um, you know, a hundred people, which is about what we have on, on the call right now. So I'm going to, uh, instead of having you look the information up, I'm going to tell you a little bit about these four terms. So the first term is an exotic plant, and the plant here on the left is a ja uh, Camellia japonica, a Japanese camellia. It's a perfect example of an exotic plant. And an exotic plant is a plant that has been planted or introduced either purposefully or accidentally. In the case of Camellia japonica, that is, has been planted purposefully. It's not a plant that spreads into natural areas, but it's a plant that people enjoy in their planned landscape. So exotic plants are a pretty broad group of plants. They're just plants that did not evolve in an area originally. Next, we get to an invasive plant. So an invasive plant is always an exotic plant, but it goes a little bit further it's an aggressive plant that has a high reproductive capacity that can start to take over ecosystems and invade natural areas. So 
exotic plants are uh, or invasive plants are exotic, but not all exotic plants are invasive. That's an important distinction. Next, we get to native plants. This is a plant that has evolved for many years in a particular area. And notice there are two components to a plant being native. The first one is the area. So every plant is native somewhere. So when you're talking about a native plant, you have to say, well, what area are you talking about? And then you have to talk about time because at one point the, the world was one continent, Pangaea, and you know the plants evolved and then they started splitting apart and then plants over the course of millions and millions of years became specific to a particular country or region or continent. So when we talk about native plants, we always talk about time and in the US we usually say, pre-European um, invasion, and we talk about area. And this is kind of a blurry map, but it is a map showing ecological regions in North America. And notice that the East Coast is one ecological region other than Southern Florida. So usually when we talk about native plants, we say the East Coast of the US, or sometimes we say East of the Mississippi. And then finally, the fourth um, definition I want to cover is that of a weed. And this is the first definition that's very subjective because, you know, a weed is sort of in the eyes of the beholder. It's what the user considers it to be. Most of us would consider a dandelion to be a weed almost everywhere. But is a corn plant a weed? not in a farmer's field of corn, but it certainly is if it's in my landscape bed. So weed has a component of, you know, where it is and whether we want it there or not. Uh, but certainly there are plenty of weeds, like dandelion's a great example, that, is not, that are not considered invasive because they don't aggressively take over a natural area, even though they can aggressively take over your own home lawn. So here's a good example of an invasive plant. This is burning bush or Euonymus elatus. And while this image uh, of Rick Darks might look beautiful, it does show you how much White Clay Creek State Park has been invaded by this shrub turning red in the fall. As you can see way in the distance, you see the red color of burning bush and it, it gives you a sense of, of how much of the forest understory has been taken over by this particular plant. Another one that um, we were talking about uh, earlier when the call began is the calorie pear. This plant has really taken off more recently as new cultivars of calorie pear have been introduced and there's cross-pollination with the old cultivar Bradford and the seedlings have just taken over roadsides up and down the East Coast. And then finally, the, the third example I want to talk about is butterfly bush. This is a plant a lot of people like because it does attract butterflies, but it does not support butterfly larvae, which are supported by native plants, which is very important. You can't have a butterfly without having a caterpillar first. Um, and while this looks like it's only one plant, if you look carefully in the field, there's all this sort of these brown seed heads which are seedlings of this one butterfly bush that have completely invaded that field. So it is a problem invasive plant in Delaware. The Delaware Invasive Species Council um, is a group, every state has one of these councils. These were uh, started by President Clinton way back when. Um, and um, the Delaware Invasive Species Council over 10 years ago put together a list of invasive plants within the state. This list has actually just been uh, revisited and expanded, but for now we're going to use this basic list. Um, the first group are these widespread and invasive plants. These are plants that are invasive and are very prevalent throughout natural areas in the state. The next list are restricted and invasive. These are plants that are just as potentially invasive, but they have not spread as widely, or they hadn't 
10, 10 plus years ago when this list was put together. And butterfly bush was on a restricted and potentially invasive plant list back at that time that this list was created. Now, um, this is, a, I think, a really good graphic to help understand the issues of invasive plants. And um, invasion happens in stages. First, a plant is introduced, then it becomes established, then it proliferates, and then it starts to impact the natural areas in, in which it, it, it is growing. If we can catch these plants at the introduction stage, it's pretty easy to eliminate them. Um, that's, there are things you could do that are very effective and they don't cost very much. By the time you get to the stage where natural areas are being impacted, the effectiveness of, of removal is low and the cost is very high. So it's important to be looking back in these early stages of introduction and establishment when we're trying to control um, invasive plants. So another distinction I wanna make that's really important is to um, look at these lists and differentiate between plants that were either introduced um, purposefully but a long time ago or accidentally introduced. So all of these plants that you currently see on the screen um, are no longer being planted purposefully by anyone. Um, they are just control problems. So they've already spread into natural areas and these have to be controlled and that's you know how we deal with those types of plants. Uh, a great example of that is multiflora rose. We will never remove all the multiflora rose in the state of Delaware. It is just not possible, um, but we can maybe control it in certain areas that have been deemed important um, to, for control. Uh, the second part of this list are plants that are still currently bought and sold in the nursery trade. You can go to a garden center and you can buy a calorie pear, you can buy a burning bush, you can buy a barberry. Um, and so these plants are kind of a different issue. Um, yes, it's important to control them in natural areas, but we also need to stop planting them in our planned landscapes and definitely remove them from planned landscapes that include these plants. That can be tough. For example, at the University of Delaware, the president's house is, is all the, street, the, the streetscape um, around the president of the University of Delaware's house are Bradford pears. They're large, they're impressive when they bloom. And um, one of my goals before I retire is to get them all removed. <laughs> but that's, that's a challenging goal because they are an attractive plant. So here we see why Bradford pears have been planted all over the place. They make a great street tree. Um, they're beautiful when they bloom. They also have nice fall color, but they really impact natural areas and have taken over, they've particularly taken over some disturbed areas on the roadside, but they have also taken over wooded areas as well. So now, hopefully, Jules has made it to uh, Gibraltar and um, she is going to show you some of the invasive plants that are present in this historic landscape. Well, I apologize for the fact that we're about to get a t terrible storm. I looked at the radar right before I walked out of my house and there's a terrible storm coming right over the top of Gibraltar. I don't know where everybody else is located, but that's what we're dealing with. So I'm here with my umbrella to show you some of the invasive plants and I hope you can continue to hear me as the rain is coming down a little bit harder now. I wanted to start by showing you this particular plant, which is uh, a big problem for us here at Gibraltar, but it, this is on the outside of the building and it is a Chinese wisteria. Sue, are you able to see it? Uh, it's a little blurry, but I can't, uh, yeah, now we see it. Okay, 
So Sue, you can talk a little bit about the wisteria. And as you can see, the impact of this is quite huge on this old building, um, which was part of the greenhouse complex for the gardens. Yeah, so I mean, wisteria is um, sort of a classic plant that was used by Marion Coffin and others um, at, at her, you know, the, at that time. Um, and uh, it was interesting when I went to on a tour of uh, uh, Dumbarton Oaks, which is a garden that was designed by Gertrude Jekyll um, at about the same time as Marianne Coffin was working. Um, when we went on that tour, the groundskeeper said the very first tool he hands every employee is a pair of pruning shears because they have so much wisteria that they have to keep under control. And if you do keep it under control, you can prevent it from invading. But the trouble is when a garden like Gibraltar has not been kept under control for many years, the wisteria can really take off and um, get into the wooded areas and natural areas, and it's a it's a real problem. Um, so hopefully everyone is able to see some of the plants that Marion Coffin used in her design. This is Pachysandra and um, English Ivy, and um, she also used Vinca quite extensively. And so um, I have an image of Vinca that I'll show you as well. I just wanted to point out that this was Marion Coffin's design for around the formal fountain was to use several plants which we consider to be invasive today. And as you can see, she used it extensively in this garden on both sides of the formal LA. And, you know, for, from a preservation standpoint, I just think it's interesting to note that here on our statue, you can see the ivy cl climbing up the statue. And in a garden like Gibraltar, where uh, we try to take good care of all of our different um, architectural elements, um, it, it becomes complicated at times to keep these plants that are more aggressive off of the architecture or the architectural elements. So Japanese barberry is a great example of a plant that's still in the nursery trade. You can still buy it. A lot of people think that, oh, well, the plant that's invading the woods is not the barberry I planted because I planted a red color, red leaved barberry. But the trouble is when the barberry um, seeds into a wooded area, the seedlings that come up are usually not red. They are, are green. And so when we see barberry in natural areas, it's often just green barberry, but that does not mean that it didn't come from the barberry that was planted in somebody's planned landscape. So hopefully you all can see this. It's, um, again, as Sue was just mentioning, it's a green barberry. Um, it's got a lovely form overall, and um, it's on the edge or the perimeter of our landscape um, on the, inside of our wall. So in some ways you might think a plant like this being here is not a bad idea for security purposes. Certainly you wouldn't want to jump over the wall and head or hit barberry. Um, but as Sue has mentioned, this is, this is not a plant that we would necessarily want to be in the landscape. If you see the plants in front of that, it's a seedling of a native red bud, um, Cercis canadensis. And so you can see that there are some plants that are native that do seed into the landscape and a plant like the barberry which is taking up a lot of space behind that red bud seedling is going to displace the opportunistic native plants. So I'm going to walk over to the um, Norway maple. So one of the things we wanted to do with this workshop was originally we had intended to have it in the garden um, and the, the good news is we were able to reach a lot more people than we would have reached if we had the workshop in the garden. But the bad news was that you didn't actually get to see these plants. So um, we tried to make the best of both worlds. And Jules is really taking the brunt by being out in the rain, helping us do that. I feel like one of those uh, weather.com reporters. So um, let me show you now the... Um, 
Norway maple seedling that you can see growing um, with a lot of other plants uh, around it, which includes the English ivy. Again, the English ivy is starting to creep up of our, our statue and also up the other trees. But the Norway maple is the invasive plant of interest here that I wanted Sue to be able to tell you about. So Norway maple is a plant that is a tough plant. It's been used in tons of urban landscapes, um, but it has also then invaded a lot of urban parks and wood, wooded areas. Uh, one of the things that Norway maple does is it has what we call allelopathy. It puts out a chemical from its roots such that only Norway maple seedlings can grow below a Norway maple. So it's a great strategy for reproduction of Norway maple, but it's a problem if you're trying to have a biodiverse landscape because it's hard to get anything else to grow under a Norway maple. And that's one of the strategies that a Norway maple uses to take over. Thanks, Sue. And um, as you can see here, I'm back in the woods where the, you can see the tea house in the distance and Marion Coffin designed a lovely woodland trail to get away from the formality of the um, LA and to connect us back to the flower garden. As I walking down the path, I was um, encountering this multiflora rose, which is sort of cutting across the pathway. Of course, it's a rose and it's full of thorns. So it's a very inconvenient location for this plant. Sue and I have done a lot of work on trying to remove multiflora rose from, uh, from woodlot areas, and they have extensive root systems, and they're very opportunistic. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about it while I walk out of the garden. I'm going to go ahead and reshare my screen. Um, so uh, this is just my uh, Dunbarton Oaks wisteria slide. At emphasizing how pruning shears are absolutely critical to keep wisteria under control. Um, and that hasn't been done, unfortunately, in lots of landscapes, including Gibraltar. So what can we do about invasive plants? Well, Delaware does have a few laws on the books. The first weed law is a noxious weed law. This weed law does not do very much though for helping the, with the issue of, nat of invasive plants because it was a law that was written to prevent, um, uh, to, to protect agriculture from known noxious weeds. And so every state has a noxious weed law and every state has a different number of noxious weeds on their list. Delaware only has six. I think Pennsylvania has 32 uh, noxious weeds on their list, but most of these weeds are not necessarily weeds that impact natural areas. They're weeds that impact agriculture. So this law is not particularly useful in controlling invasive plants. Delaware also has a law on the books that deals with nuisance plants. So somebody who was fairly high up in the Delaware uh, legislature um, w must have had a neighbor that had bamboo and they were able to push through a law um, that um, said that if you have a nuisance plant and you're impacting a neighbor, you have to remove that invasive plant. Um, or excuse me, that nuisance plant. And uh, this law was in force for a while. It had a list of plants that were nuisance plants and that list included bamboo. That's all it said. Well, bamboo is a common name. Um, bamboo has hundreds of uh, species that would be called bamboo. In fact, there's a plant called Nandina, heavenly bamboo, that isn't a, actually a bamboo at all. And it became very confusing. It became very difficult to enforce. And so what Delaware did, it's very hard to get rid of a law once you have it, but it's very easy to remove a plant from a list. So now we have a law that outlaws nuisance plants, but there are no nuisance plants on the list. So that's not going to be a very effective law um, dealing with invasive species. Now we have a new law that was introduced just this spring 
Um, it was um, championed by Stephanie Hansen. She's a relatively new state senator. She's an environmental lawyer who has a passion for native plants and controlling invasive plants. And so I never thought it would happen, but it has. Um, this law has passed the Senate and is probably going to pass the House, and it will outlaw the sale and distribution and propagation of plants that are on the Delaware Invasive Species Council plant list. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this law and laws in general a little bit later in the talk. So I mentioned that I have differentiated between plants that are in the trade and plants that are not in the trade. So we're gonna talk first about those plants that are not currently in the nursery trade. You can't go buy Japanese stilt grass anywhere, thank goodness. Um, but those plants have to be controlled. Um, this is a URL that's on the screen for this particular uh, fact, uh, fact sheet or brochure, but uh, you don't have to frantically copy down that URL. Um, if you Google controlling backyard invaders, this brochure will come up. So it's very easy to find this on the internet and it, it lists control strategies for a lot of these plants that have invaded natural areas. Um, probably the best form of control is mechanical removal. This is a tool called a weed wrench, which gives you leverage and allows you to pull out um, small to medium sized shrubs and trees. Um, and um, it's a pretty effective way of removing invasive plants on a relatively small scale. But if you get a lot of volunteers working together, you can get even large areas removed of invasive plants. The key here is that the roots are being pulled out by this weed wrench um, as well as the, the tops. Um, you could also use a strategy like mowing. This is Japanese stilt grass. It's an annual grass and it goes to seed once a year in the fall in September. So if you mow it before the seeds mature, you can prevent that crop of seeds from getting established. The trouble is there's so much Japanese stilt grass everywhere that if you control it in one specific area, more seed can probably blow in from another area. So it's a little bit frustrating to control Japanese stilt grass. Now, another option is to use herbicides, chemicals. Uh, so this person is spraying uh, an herbicide into a, a woodland. I'm not a huge proponent of this strategy when it's done this way, because it's hard to be super selective. You know, what other plants is that spray of herbicide hitting as it's being, you know, sprayed out through the air? A better solution is to use a backpack sprayer where you can target the plant that you're trying to kill. This was a roadside project where um, we had uh, in Delaware, as I-95 cuts through Wilmington, um, this area had been let go and there was a lot of tree of heaven. It was pretty much all tree of heaven or ailanthus. And we spent three years controlling the tree of heaven on this slope before we went back and replanted with desirable plant species. This was actually a project that was done by Andrew Pogon Associates, a landscape firm in uh, Philadelphia. Another strategy is to actually cut the invasive plant and then put the chemical right on that cut surface. So you're not spraying an herbicide out into the environment, you're targeting the plant that you're trying to control. You can also use timing. So this is Japanese honeysuckle. If you use glyphosate to control plants, it, it needs to hit green tissue. So notice there's green tissue on this honeysuckle, but the white stuff on the ground is snow. So um, most, if not all, of the native species that might be present are underground at this point. So you can pretty much spray over the top of this honeysuckle and you'll get some uptake by the honeysuckle and some selective control without harming native species that are underground. 
Another strategy is to use biological control. This is mile a minute. It's another annual. And there is an insect that, um, that keeps this mile a minute under control in its native habitat, which is Korea. Um, and that insect has been imported after years of study to make sure that the insect will not harm any other species, that it's highly um, specific to mile a minute. And it has been released in areas and it's doing, um, it's providing some control of mile a minute. Another plant that um, has had successful biological control is um, lithrum or purple loosestrife, particularly in Canada. They have had good success with controlling purple loosestrife by the release of uh, that, this particular beetle. So purple loosestrife is a problem in wet areas um, and the beetle will eat the foliage and provide a fair amount of control. Biological control will never eradicate a plant, but it can help keep it um, somewhat in check. Now, I mentioned that when you remove a plant, you have to replace it with something else or else the invasive is just going to come right back. So this is a slope that was completely covered in Japanese stiltgrass. It was mown for a couple of years to reduce the seed load. And then it was replanted with a hard fescue or a low fescue to hold that space. And I have to admit to you that it worked for a couple of years and then the Japanese stiltgrass just came back. So some plants are not strong enough to prevent the reinvasion of a plant like Japanese stiltgrass. Now, in another area of this same landscape, the Japanese stiltgrass was mowed, and then a large number of fern plugs were planted. And um, at first, it was like a treasure hunt to find the fern plugs because there was so much Japanese stiltgrass still growing. But the Japanese stiltgrass is fairly easy to pull, and eventually the ferns started to take over, and that area is now all ferns. So one of the things that happens in natural systems is that no, there is no prescribed strategy that's going to work every time in every situation. There's a lot of trial and error for what's going to work in a particular site. And that can be frustrating, especially to novices. Um, you want a prescription of what to do exactly where. And unfortunately, um, biology and landscapes don't usually work that way. Um, here is our roadside project that I mentioned earlier in the where I-95 cuts through Wilmington. After the Tree of Heaven was all removed, there were two major strategies for holding that land. One was planting the hard fescue, and the other was planting the shrub, uh, Rus aromatica, or um, the uh, very aggressive colonizing sumac. So where you see the straw, that's where the sumac was planted. Where you see the hydra seeding, the green, that's where the low fescue was seeded. And this worked very well in downtown Wilmington. There's much less Japanese stiltgrass pressure in Wilmington, so the low fescue was able to hold the slope um, and really fill in, a, in addition to having some native trees and shrubs. And then these are the masses of, um, of sumac uh, that were planted, Rus aromatica. And you can see they filled in and they're really solid and they're holding the ground and they have not allowed the tree of heaven to come back in any large manner in, in, this, in this landscape. Okay, so that's dealing with plants that are um, problem plants, how to remove them from the landscape. Now we want to talk a little bit about those plants that are still bought and sold in the nursery trade. Things like burning bush or calorie pear or Japanese barberry, Norway maple, Jules pointed out at, um, in, at Gibraltar. Um, and I teach a class in plant, called Plants and Human Culture, and we cover invasive plants. And every fall, we have a debate. Um, the students love it. They love to argue. And there are two debate 
uh, topics. One is non-native plants are a problem for ecosystems. So I have one group that says yes and one group that says no. And then the second debate topic is Delaware should have a law against the possession and sale of invasive plants. And again, there's a group that says yes and a group that says no. And they vote on, on who the winners are every year. What's come out of that debate in, in my mind is that um, often, you know, people talk about this concept of having a law to control invasive plants, but others who are arguing on the opposite side of having a law come up with some of these as you know, problems with an invasive plant law, like who decides which plants are invasive, how many plants are on the list, what happens to the industries that are currently buying and selling those plants? How will it be funded? How will it be enforced? What happens when a surrounding state still sells that plant? So these are all issues that have to be grappled with if you are going to enforce or, or enact a law against invasive plants, which is why for many years we have focused on a different strategy of education rather than legislation. The Plants for a Livable Delaware program that Jules mentioned in my introduction is something that was started probably now 20 years ago. Um, and the idea uh, which we stole from uh, John Peter Thompson, who's a Maryland nurseryman, he owns Banky's Nursery. And, and what he said was, if at my garden center, I just stop selling English ivy, my customers will buy it someplace else. So what if I put up a sign that says English ivy is a problem plant, here are some alternatives that you can plant instead of English ivy. And we thought that was a great idea, kind of let the marketplace um, remove invasive plants from, from the uh, nursery industry. And so we did that in Delaware. We started the Plants for a Livable Delaware program and we identified problem plants like barberry. And then we listed plants that could be planted instead of barberry, something like uh, ink, um, inkberry holly. Um, and we identified them as plants for a livable Delaware. Uh, as part of this project, we produced four different brochures. Um, the Plants for a Livable Delaware brochure focuses on about 10 plants that are known invasives and lists alternative plants that could be planted instead. I've already talked a little bit about the Controlling Backyard Invaders brochure. The Livable Plants for a Home Landscape looks at particular sites like dry shade, woodland edge, sunny slope, because most people, when they think about landscaping, they have a place in mind and they want some suggestions for that place. So that brochure was uh, designed around specific locations and what would be a good combination of plants to use. And then the final brochure focused on livable ecosystems, talking about how do you include things like a meadow or a forest or some of these other types of landscapes, a rain garden, um, a pollinator garden, things like that into um, an existing landscape. So uh, one of the things we've realized about an educational uh, campaign is that while I'm passionate about plants, not everyone is, and it's important to link plants to the charismatic fauna that people tend to care about and birds and butterflies are are high up on that list so while you may not be able to get people passionate about planting milkweed you can get them to be passionate about attracting monarch butterflies so if we focus on what native plants can do for promoting birds and butterflies that's a pretty good strategy for getting people to care about removing invasive plants from their landscapes. It's important to, to demonstrate sites where invasives have been removed and native plants have been planted. Uh, Jules and I had a big project um, in the Applecross development where we actually renovated a home landscape and showed how to incorporate a meadow, how to incorporate a, a little woodland area, and how to put in a lot of uh, native plants. Um, 
some of the places that make good sites for demonstrations are government buildings, hospitals, corporate headquarters, et cetera. If anyone has an in with Christiana Medical Center, give me a call after, the, after this or send me an email because I would love to get that campus to, to use sustainable practices, remove all their invasive species, remove all their lawn and let it be something else because everyone at some point in time goes to the hospital, whether it's for themselves or to visit somebody. I think we could make a big impact on what people see as an acceptable landscape by uh, making some changes at, at a landscape like, like a hospital. Um, so an educational campaign cannot be um, promoted by just one agency. It's got to be, um, you know, a bunch of different people working together. And it has been in Delaware. This is the list of organizations that have been proponents of promoting native plants and reducing uh, the use of invasive plants. Um, but uh, we haven't been 100% effective. I want to share with you um, now, um, well, before, before I get into this, I just want to um, mention that what I think is going to be really effective about this new law that hopefully will be in place before too long is that it is going to really raise awareness. So things that we just have not been able to do with our educational campaign can be accomplished when a new law is passed. So it will increase the publicity about invasive plants. We saw this happen in Newcastle County when we had the um, ban on yard waste. People were not really that aware of the impact of yard waste on our landfills or what you could do about yard waste instead of just putting it out for the trash. And when we banned yard waste in Newcastle County, it raised people's awareness of that issue, gave them alternatives of what they could do. Um, and so I think the same thing could happen with an invasive plant law. So that is, is at least my hope that we will get a lot more people to be aware of this invasive plant issue once a law is passed. Now, I want to just share with you a couple of examples of landscapes that are, have really embraced the issue of sustainability and um, have done a good job with uh, promoting that type of landscape. This is actually a corporate headquarters of a company in Atlanta. This picture was taken over 20 years ago. I was on an urban forestry program in Atlanta. And um, the, it's, it's a really great story. The, this was a company in Ohio that had purchased a large tract of land and they, um, they were going to pretty much cut down all the trees and put in their corporate headquarters with a big huge lawn. Uh, fortunately, there was an urban forester in Atlanta who got word of this uh, sort of travesty that was going to occur, called up the CEO of the company and said, you have to come down and look at this site that you're considering cutting and, um, and see if that's what you really want to do. So the CEO and the CFO flew down to Atlanta. They met with the urban forester. They realized how beautiful the site was and they did a 180. They completely changed their tack. They redesigned their facility they had an impact on the soil of only five feet outside the building. So there was a lay down area either inside the building or five feet outside of the building. Um, they, had they used big rubber tires on all their equipment and they maintained most of the landscape. They created this glass walled um, uh, lunch room for their employees. They have this uh, lovely, uh, small planned landscape with trails going out into the woods. And they also um, recorded all kinds of productivity figures, um, which they had from their previous headquarters in Ohio. When they moved to Atlanta, they took those same measures 
and they went off the charts in productivity. So they you know, had fewer sick days, they had much less turnover, they had you know, much better performance of their employees in this type of a landscape. So um, you know, it shows that you a landscape can really impact the bottom line of a company. Another landscape I want to talk about for a minute is the High Line in New York City. So um, it's a great model of a very different type of landscape than what we're familiar with. Um, it is not the original landscape that came into this abandoned rail line that was going to be torn down, but the people of New York City, or at least some of them, raised billions of dollars to recreate a park um, up above. Um, you know, uh, one story up in, in New York. Um, and the, the plantings, the herbaceous plantings were designed by Pete Udolf, a Dutch um, designer. And they were intended to sort of mimic the type of landscape that had just evolved on this abandoned rail line over the course of uh, 40 or 50 years. And it's a definitely a different aesthetic from a typical public garden. It's certainly a different aesthetic from what Marion Coffin designed at, at Gibraltar. But people love this landscape and the more people visit it and see it, the more chance that this type of aesthetic will become acceptable to people in their home landscapes or in uh, other planned landscapes. This is a, a, a Emscher Park, it's in Germany, it's an abandoned factory that has had kind of plants just retake the space and it's now become a park that people love and, and visit. This is another abandoned factory. This one is out in Western Pennsylvania and um, it actually has you know, wonderful spaces that have um, just been managed, nothing's been planted, this butterfly weed just uh, came in on its own, um, and it's become so popular that they are actually have weddings there, they have a garden walk, you have to pay, you buy tickets to go see this landscape. So again, it's a very different aesthetic, but people are starting to appreciate that. In our own state of Delaware, we have landscapes like the Curtis Paper Mill site. Um, the, the factory was, was um, torn down and they had hoped to keep the um, tower. Uh, unfortunately, it was deemed um, not stable enough and it had to be knocked down as well. Um, but it was abandoned for a number of years and a, a huge number of plants came back into the site. Now, I am not saying that this is a gorgeous planned landscape, but it's got a lot of biodiversity and it's a starting point that could be managed and made to be a really fascinating landscape, similar to some of the other examples that I just gave. Unfortunately, what happened instead was a very traditional park was planted, very little biodiversity, mostly lawn and pavement. And um, that's what we are still kind of currently doing these days. So we need people to be thinking more creatively about how can we take a landscape like this one and manipulate it to be something beautiful rather than chop it all down and just plant grass and have pavement and, and a, a few benches here and there. So another example is the Chrysler site in Newark, uh, purchased by the university. Um, the very first company that came into this site was Bloom Technology. And Jules and I were involved in a project where we, we looked at, so, you know, again, nature reclaims a lot of these industrial spaces, as um, we can see here. Um, this was actually a graduate student's project looking at some some controlled planting versus uh, invasive plant removal because a lot of butterfly bush came into that site and how can we sort of manage that takeover by plants. 
Um, and so uh, when, when Bloom Energy came in, um, Jules and I had the opportunity to be part of a design charrette where we worked with their CEO, we worked with the person that was going to be in charge of managing the landscape. And originally, this was going to be a very large area of just mown turf. And I said to the, the landscape manager, do you really want to mow however many acres it was? I don't remember now, 50 acres of, of turf. And he said, no, I really don't. So we came up with a very different scenario um, of Part of the area that was for future expansion was planted to hay that was then used by UD's um, uh, horses. Uh, some areas were planned to be woodlands and have a walking trail through them. And then a fairly large area was planned as a meadow, again, with trails through it. And um, that has been instituted. They have a really, really wide path. <laughs> But um, this meadow is a lot easier to maintain than mowed lawn would have been. So some of these changes are happening. Um, the final example that I wanna give, this is a, a friend's school outside of Baltimore where um, they have, again, a much more sustainable landscape um, and um, they are, are selling their school to parents and and students um, by the fact uh, one of the ways they sell their school is that they are working with the landscape rather than trying to always fight against the landscape and so it's a trend that i think um, really needs to be encouraged and um and you know we can get there the final image that I want to share with you is something that um, I uh, probably have shown in, in at least 100, maybe 200 talks now. Uh, as part of the Plants for a Livable Delaware program, I did a Friends of Ag breakfast with um, Faith Kuhn, who's now retired from the Department of Ag, and Val Ann Budishak. And each of us were going to give our, our specific 10 minute blurb. And I was putting the slides together. And this was the last slide. It's a picture of White Clay Creek State Park. And I said to Faith, who was going last, at the end, just say something nice about the park as sort of, you know, why we care about managing invasive plants. And what Faith said, I think was really spectacular. And so that's why I've repeated it over a hundred times. What she said was, when I borrow something from somebody, I always like to return it in at least as good condition as it was when I borrowed it. And so if you think about the landscape as something that we're borrowing from our children and our children's children, don't we want to return it to them or give it to them in at least as good condition as we received it, if not better. And I've never met an audience that wasn't impacted by that concept of how important it is to manage our landscape so that we provide something valuable for our children and our children's children. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about invasive plants. We have just a little bit of time left and um, I'll open it up. I think Jules can moderate questions. If you have yeah, so Sue, I'm happy to moderate and I have been watching the chat box. So I have a couple that I've just um, taken right off the top. Uh, one is about Japanese maples. Um, is it okay to plant Japanese maples or would you uh, advise that we look for a different plant? So Japanese maples are one of those plants. They are now on the newer list of Delaware invasive, the, the Delaware Invasive Species Council. They definitely seed into natural areas. So if we think about that chart, if we can, you know, control a plant like Japanese maple before it has completely invaded our natural areas, it's probably a good idea. I know that's hard for some people to take. They are a beautiful small tree that has been used successfully in landscapes. But um, so I, and I would never, they certainly will not be on the list for the new law yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. So 
it will not be against the law to plant a Japanese maple. But if you are looking for a plant that will do a better job of sustaining uh, native insects and native birds, um, I would suggest that you can choose many other small trees that would perform the same function as a Japanese maple, but not spread into natural areas. That's great. Thank you, Sue. And another question is about multiflora rows, about what are the most successful methods for removing uh, multiflora rows? Um, so perhaps one of the uh, things about especially in a pollinator meadow. So, okay, in a pollinator meadow, um, that meadow could should be mown at least once a year, um, and sometimes uh, twice a year, depending upon the meadow. Um, no more than that, um, but um, so when you mow once a year, you will dramatically reduce the woody plants that are in the meadow. So multiflora rose will continue to sprout for a while, but if it's mowed fairly regularly, you know, once or twice a year, year after year after year, eventually it will not be able to survive that mowing. As far as removing multiflora rose from the woods, one of the good things about multiflora rose is it has a crown. So if you can get out the crown, you do not have to get the entire root system. So they're not that difficult to dig out. A long spade, you can get, dig under the plant and you can pull up the crown and remove it that way. I live in a thir on a 13 acre property that's mostly wooded. And when you looked out my kitchen window, when I first moved in 20 years ago, the entire woods was green in the winter because it had multiflora rose in it. And it took me about three years of just removing the multiflora rose with my long spade, moving as, you know, across the landscape. And now when you look down into my wooded area, you don't see it anymore. Um, so it is possible. Now, it's hard to do that on hundreds of acres, <laughs> but um, it is possible to, to remove multiflora rose. That doesn't mean multiflora rose won't come back because birds drop the, the seeds. So it's not something that you can say, okay, done. You, you've got to keep on top of, of something like that. But, but in a meadow, mowing will, will prevent multiflora rose from becoming too established. Thank you, Sue. Um, I've had two questions, one in the chat and one by email about goats. And you and I have done some work on goats uh, in, in, as part of a class project. Can you just uh, let people know if that's an effective method, especially in a historic garden? Would you ever recommend it for preservation purposes? And sure. what plants should they avoid, if any? Okay, so goats are, will eat multiflora rose. So if you've got an area that's really choked with multiflora rose and you can confine goats to that area, they will, they will eat it down. Um, but they will also eat a lot of native species. And, you know, in a garden like Gibraltar, they're not going to just eat the invasives. <laughs> they're going to eat whatever they feel like eating. Um, so they have a there's a limited use to goats i you know if you want to really clear out an area that's been completely invaded and you don't care if everything's gone and then later you're going to go back in and replant with desirable species goats can work i it was in nashville um, my daughter was running a marathon three years ago and um i was walking along uh, uh the river's edge and noticed that there were a whole bunch of goats on a fenced in and there were no humans there but there were a couple of guard dogs so the the dogs were kind of guarding the goats and the goats were working on clearing out all the vegetation on the slope but of course something has to be replanted in that area once the goats are finished great thank you um question about honeysuckle um, is all the honeysuckle that you see outside that's kind of yellow and white, uh, 
the non is it a non native invasive honeysuckle? Yeah. So most of what we see, most of the honeysuckle we see is Japanese honeysuckle. The white and yellow is Japanese honeysuckle. It's very invasive. I have some ferns at the end of my driveway, and just yesterday I went out to try to pull the honeysuckle out of these ferns that are on a slope. Unfortunately, there's also a ton of poison ivy in there. So at one, at, I finally decided, all right, if I don't want to be covered with poison ivy, I've got to regroup and think about a different strategy for getting this honeysuckle out. There is native honeysuckle. Um, the, uh, there's a yellow and there's kind of an orangey red. Um, John Clayton is a cultivar of one of the um, native honeysuckles. So that's Lanicera semper virens is the native honeysuckle. It's a fabulous plant. You can, it's very vigorous. You can grow it in your garden. But Lanicera japonica is the vine that's the Japanese honeysuckle. And that's mostly what you see in the wild. Um, there are also shrubby honeysuckles that are also problems in, in the woodland. So the only good honeysuckle is the Lanicera semper virens. Thank you. Um, there was a question about the Apple Cross project. Um, somebody must know our project, Sue. They said they understand that the meadow was removed. What were the lessons learned about the removal <laughs> of the meadow? Well, that kind of gets at what I showed you at the very end, um, the High Line and a couple of the Bloom Energy Project, a couple of the projects where I didn't show you Longwood Gardens Meadow, but I feel like Longwood Gardens having a meadow that's open to the public kind of really catapulted the concept of meadows and as, as an acceptable landscape. Um, because like if Longwood can do it, everybody should be able to do it, right? Um, and, and as people start to become more familiar and comfortable with that type of landscape, more and more people will say, yes, I can have that in my home landscape. I thought, Jules thought, lots of the people that we came, that came to visit Apple Cross thought the meadow was beautiful. It had a little path going in, it had a circular moat area, it had a path going back out. But the homeowner didn't think that way. And so, you know, it's his house. He gets to control it. After the project was over, he, he wanted it mowed, mowed back and, and grass put back in. So I think it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It takes a lot of people showing what it can look like. And then people have to become more used to it and more comfortable with it. Like I said, you know, we've got this love affair with the lawn that started 200 years ago. It's gonna take a while for us to uh, accept a different type of landscape. That's great, thank you, Sue. Um, this is a really relevant question to this audience, so I wanna make sure we get to it. Is there a resource for historically accurate non-invasive species in Delaware that would be good for museums, historic houses, et cetera? Well, um, the brochures that I showed you do a lot of listing of desirable species um, to replace invasive species. So the Plants for a Livable Delaware brochure lists a lot of plants, the Livable Landscapes lists a lot of plants, and the Ecosystem Services lists a lot of plants. So if you're looking for plants that, and, and most of them are native, but some of them are not native, but they're not invasive. So they're exotic plants that aren't invasive. Um, so I would recommend those brochures as good sources of plants. Now, as far as historic landscapes, that completely depends on the specific landscape. So if you want to be, you know, if you want to be completely historically correct in a garden, then you need to keep the plants that Marion Coffin designed. Um, and then it, with something like English ivy, for example, you can manage English ivy by not allowing it to get to a mature stage where it would fruit. And you can manage something like Pachysandra by not allowing it to escape into any natural areas. But it takes labor in order to do that. Like my pruning shears example with wisteria, it takes a lot of labor 
in order to do that. So if you're managing a historic landscape, you really have to decide, can we put the labor in to manage this landscape and have it be perfectly historically correct? Or should we say, okay, what Marion Coffin meant was we want a ground cover that will provide a carpet in this area, but it doesn't have to be Pachysandra or it doesn't have to be Ivy. It can be a different species that will perform that landscape function without being an invasive plant. And that's really for every garden manager to, to decide. I'm not gonna tell them, tell garden managers what they need to do in order to maintain a historic garden but you can maintain the essence of a garden without necessarily maintaining exactly the same species. And the way those brochures are set up, they, particularly the one, the Plants for a Livable Delaware, it provides suggestions. If you're gonna remove your vinca, what can you plant in its place? Right. Um, I think we're close to the end of our time frame, and I wanted to remind everyone that if you enjoyed this talk today, which we were able to provide you for free during this lunchtime hour, uh, we would love it if you would consider donating to Preservation Delaware. You can just visit us on the website, and there's a link to donate, and we would uh, really appreciate your support. And um, I want to thank Sue Barton for providing us a great lecture. There were a couple more comments in the chat that um, I hope that I was able to answer along the way as well. Um, Sue is um, an outstanding resource as a, as a cooperative extension um, professional. She uh, writes a column on a regular basis. Sue, you're still doing your column, correct? Yes, although I'm not sure the news journal is, is printing it. Um, they have highly reduced staff. And so um, I haven't seen it recently, even though I keep submitting columns. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, maybe we can find that at Delaware, the news journal online. Um, and, uh, and she also um, has, uh, you know, she's a professional who works at the University of Delaware. So if you have a specific question about a plant, for example, um, I'm sure Sue wouldn't mind trying to give you an answer. No, you can email me at sbarton at udel.edu and I'll do my best. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sue. Um, well, with that, that concludes our event. Um, this has been a, a really great turnout. At one point, we had 102 attendees, which is just fantastic. And uh, we thank you all for uh, joining us today. And I hope you have a, a great day. It looks like we were inside through the rain and it's passed. And now everybody can get outside and scope their uh, properties for invasive plants. And I uh, hope you don't find any. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye.